This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetacy. I'm Bridget Fetacy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. Walk-Ins Welcome is excited to partner with Calm, the number one app for sleep, meditation, and relaxation, named App of the Year last year by Apple. For a limited time, Walk-Ins Welcome listeners can get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash walk-in. That's C-A-L-M dot C-O-M slash W-A-L-K-I-N. It includes unlimited access to all of Calm's amazing content that will have you drifting off to dreamland in no time. This week, we're deviating from the normal walk-ins welcome format because a lot of people have been asking me who I am and what I do and how I got here and what is fetacy and a lot of questions. So I thought I'd start this new segment that we'll do occasionally called Story Hour with Bridget Fetacy. All righty. It's Story Hour time. Do we have a theme song for that yet? <laughs> it's story hour with Bridget Fantasy. <laughs> oh, that you just did it. You took care of it. Check. <laughs> and her cousin Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we decided on waitressing as the topic of this conversation. Yes, we had multiple requests for waitressing stories. Seeing as how Maggie and I both have spent lots of time waiting tables. Yeah, but they're not interested in my stories. My stories they are mundane. They are so, Maggie. They <laughs> want to know about you. You're just hiding from the world. And the world wants to know, who is this cousin Maggie? What is the her The world story? will have to wait. <laughs> Someone said to me the other day, don't let, don't sell your your story, your life story until you're ready. Don't tell your life story in a book. And I was like, how do you think I've got this far? <laughs> Just by telling all my stories. I'm exhausted. I've been up since 4 a.m. Writing. Mm. Writing satire. It is now 3 p.m. Just for to give some people. Yeah, some I reference. suddenly feel like. <laughs> Should we do this another day? No, we can do it. I'm. I'm in it. I'll just be a little loopy. Well, loopy Bridget is the funniest Bridget. Or I'll fall asleep like Jeff Garland did in our <laughs> podcast. <laughs> okay. So you started working in restaurants when you were, what, 14, 15? Yeah, I think it must have been around there. I was. It was one summer when I went to visit my dad right after my parents got divorced. So I was... 12 when they separated, 13 when they got divorced, and probably 14. So yeah, probably like eighth grade. Mm -hmm. and I have a bad memory. I mean, it's... I it's, know. Well, I'll try and help you find the truth. <laughs> it's just a bad... I. It's like my inability to remember the plots of books or movies uh -huh. or even our podcasts or anything. So my first job was when I was 10 and I weighed it. I, I didn't weigh tables. <laughs> <laughs> I folded clothes and did light household chores for this family that lived across the street and they had horses. Huh. And this was in Connecticut. My brother, the next one down, he worked with the horses. And then my fourth, the fourth one of us down, she she started working with horses and she loves them. And she was really little. Yeah, she must have been because I was I was if you were little. ten, she was six. Yeah, seven. around there. And I had to fold clothes. The reason I remember this job so vividly is because I had to make them tuna fish every week. And I had they had these two ugly greyhounds. And I, I like most dogs, but these greyhounds were weird. Greyhounds are weird. Yeah, greyhounds are weird. And they made me squeeze out all the tuna juice into their dog bowl, which I have done once before for Hope, and she loves it. So uh -huh. I guess it's good for their coats or something, but huh. oh my gosh. I don't know why. It was just... Wait, have we just uncovered your the reason you loathe folding clothes? <laughs> 
<laughs> Maybe because that was my job. Because this is whenever Bridget does laundry, it will sit in the basket for like two weeks. <laughs> and it was a family of four. But mind you, I also helped my mom fold, fold all, all the, the clothes. clothes. No wonder you hate folding clothes. For four kids. Uh-huh. And this family, it was like them and two kids. And I folded all their clothes and I hated it. I hated it. Uh-huh. And I used to listen to that song. I had the biggest crush on this guy, Matt Silver. And I would listen on my Walkman to She Drives Me Crazy. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Over and over and over again while I folded clothes. Wow. Well. I remember that. And think about Matt Silver. Why Mm -hmm. did he come? Oh, okay. (laughs) I would imagine driving him crazy. (laughs) Okay. Thank you for the context. (laughs) All right. That's why I would imagine that. And that started really early too. That deep enjoyment of torturing men. You've always been boy crazy. Boy crazy, but the the, like, I don't feel alive unless I'm torn. No, I'm tormenting someone. (laughs) specifically a man <laughs> well yeah definitely i i think that's why i know i'm not bi i've never really gotten off on tormenting women uh-huh. i like being with women but i don't like tormenting them and driving emotionally them the way you do man <laughs> not even emotionally like psychologically i think some therapists out here they're there are gonna have a field day with this one. <laughs> It's because I watched Great Expectations too many times. <laughs> when you were too young. When I was too young. The Gwyneth Paltrow version. Yeah. Where she's like, bye. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's get back to waitressing. So then when you were 14, we're guessing, mm-hmm. um, you worked as a hostess, right? Yep. At this restaurant. And what was that like? Um, I hated it. Why? I liked it, but I hated it because Lenny... <laughs> the manager of the Our restaurant manager of the restaurant a uh, family friend as well like long history because it was a family restaurant uh-huh. he would always tell me to smile which drove me crazy because oh. i was a sul- sulky teen yes a sullen yeah pissed just off emo teenager pr- recently <laughs> parents got divorced listening teen. to nirvana totally listening to nirvana and i had to dress up And he would flop on in in his shorts and his flip-flops. And I could hear him coming from a mile away (laughs) and his shuffling, flopping feet. And I would be standing at the door and there would be a line out the door. It was so busy. Uh And he would always say, you're the first impression of the restaurant, Bridget. You're the first thing everyone sees. And you're just here scowling. (laughs) And she has quite a scowl. Um, And I wasn't really angry. I was just a teenager. But... Then talk a little bit about because hostessing is not as easy as one might think. No, and I there's love a strategy hostessing. to it. I love it. And I teach hostesses always. I train them and I still love training them. And I could probably go to a restaurant and train any hostess right. <laughs> at a restaurant I didn't even work at. This is good for people who've never worked in restaurants. This is will give them a the lot of information. The hostess drives the pace of the entire restaurant. Mm-hmm. So you, the hostess is in charge of the flow of the restaurant. If you slam a waitress, you're also slamming the kitchen. If you can figure out how to seat tables so that you're tapering them throughout the different... Generally in a restaurant, every waitress or waiter will get... If it's a decent average to bigger size restaurant, you'll get a section. And what you don't want to do is put four tables in one section. Like seat them all at once. Yeah. And that totally screws you as a waitress and it happens sometimes just because if you have a certain section sometimes it's the first section that gets filled up depending on for instance if you have a place where you work outside on the patio and everyone wants to sit on the patio right but even then usually there will be uh, multiple sections out on a patio or if you have a smart manager or restaurant they will break the sections up so that even if it is a place that's likely to get seated first you're not seating one person first right. because if you seat one person first, they're going to have to take, you know, all there's no time in between your tables. Right. And then you put all the orders in at once and then the kitchen gets buried right. because now they're getting 20 orders at all least at all at once. And they all have and they were all taken a minute apart from one another instead of like five minutes. Right. And also what people don't necessarily realize is 
the first five minutes of getting a table sat, like getting a table when they're first sat, is that those are the most high touch moments when you have to go get say hi and give specials and take is anyone ready for drinks and then bring them water and then get a drink order and bring the drinks and then you get the order once that's all taken care of it's just maintenance but it's the first five to ten minutes of when a table is sat that you need to spend the most time with them and if you're sat all at once it really screws you especially because if you have a table that's high maintenance right in between two ta- three say you get three tables and you get one and you get one order in and then you get to the second one and the third one's now been waiting for the first one and the second one and the second one's high maintenance right and they're giving you this and they want you to stand there and they're asking dumb questions like what's in the lobster roll and they is want it, you to stand there while they sit and figure out what they want to order rather is, than letting you come back right is the lobster fresh right like, stupid questions like that right it's alive and then like people get pissed when you don't get to them within the first five minutes and then you're in a bad place with that table automatically right it's very stressful but hostessing, so the hostess kind of determines the flow. And as a hostess, you kind of have to be, you'll get bullied a lot by people. And you learn, I have to say, as a young teenager, it was a good job in terms of standing up for myself because I did learn how to t- talk to adults and put put them in their place when they were being bullies. Yeah. Because they will, bu- and sometimes my manager had to step in because he could see that these People were just bowling over me, but there I did learn how to say, sorry, we our waitress, our restaurant just got slammed or our waitress just got slammed and we were just holding We just like they'll right. be like, I see a table people and then will and see then. empty tables and be like, why can't I sit at that one? It's, it's like, like, well, I just sorry, sat two tables we in just that sat section. Yeah. 50 f- tables in the restaurant and we need to give them a minute to catch up. Right. So you learn to be more assertive. You learn to push back and also be um, and you're answering phones. And now it's all, it's so different now with open table and everything. Mm-hmm. It's much more digital. How would you train someone or what advice would you give them? What are the most important things you think uh, you would need to teach a hostess? I think maintaining your calm always and your standing your ground Uh uh-huh you know you have to you really do have to learn how to be polite but firm right with people because they do get so i mean any this is why i have so much respect for anyone in the food industry because you are the vehicle between people and their food and when people are hungry they're they're the worst it's true they're hangry and i understand that and I understand going out and thinking that you're going to have food within an hour and then suddenly there's a wait or whatever, but don't go out to eat hungry, right. starving. And a hostess is, it really is true. A hostess can like set a restaurant up for success or failure. It all starts at the door. And I think what happens a lot of the time in places is that they don't teach the hostess how important their job is and they don't teach them how to, t- the other thing is timing. Mm-hmm. So, I always train all my hostesses. I do not care. I mean, again, this is all digital, but if you're not at a place that's digital, I always write when the person, uh, if there's a wait list, I write what time they're on the wait list and what time I told them so Uh that there can be no confusion. And I always overestimate because now in the digital world, and this drives me insane, and if you are these people, just know that you are costing restaurants millions of dollars everywhere but people will finish their meal pay their bill and then they'll all sit at the table on their phones Uh and it is infuriating and you can't ask a table to leave right and so people will just all be sitting there like checking their instagram get the get out get Get when you're done get out yeah you are eating money Uh, and i don't again i don't think people understand this you are eating money from the restaurant you're eating money from the waitress Every single minute that you're just dilly dallying around on your Instagram, like checking your mentions is it's so you're basically stealing from the restaurant and the waitress. You're screwing your waitress over for sure. And the restaurant. Yes, the restaurant. But to put a personal face on it, like waitresses depend on tables being turned in order to make any money whatsoever. So do restaurants. No, it's true. Yeah. I mean, it screws everyone, Mm. everyone and in the whole chain. And it's 
a big problem in restaurants now. Mm-hmm. I see it all the time. People will pay and their check will be sitting there paid for and they're just all using it like a phone booth. I'm like, get out of here. Mm-hmm. I think that you should be able to tell a table to leave. Mm-hmm. And After now everyone's bill. a secret shopper thanks to Yelp, Ugh. which is just so annoying. Oh, the secret shoppers. Okay, we'll get there. <laughs> Now secret we live in a world where everyone's a secret. Yeah, but the pro- the thing I, you know what I've come to learn is that at least secret shoppers were trained. Uh-huh. So secret shoppers, for those of you who don't know this, we lived in fear of them oh, <laughs> in God. the restaurant industry. Because before they had Yelp, they these companies that would come in, they would hire a company essentially, they being whatever restaurant you work for, to and they had these professional shoppers and they would come uh, either it could be retail or it could be a restaurant and they would come in and they would rate every every part of the experience from beginning to end right and each restaurant could individualize like depending on how fancy it was it was like did they tell you the specials did they give you suggestions for wine pairings did they blah 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 blah. and if you didn't tick every box your your score suffered i was terrible i (laughs) never i never got secret shopped in all of the time that i waitress really isn't that insane that's nuts yeah considering how many hours on the floor i spent it's Uh crazy that i never got secret shopped or i did and i just don't remember it but right but so we lived in fear of them, and now with Yelp, everyone thinks they're a secret shopper, but they're not trained. Right? They're just like civvies. Yeah. <laughs> like at least secret, at least secret shoppers knew what to look for. They knew what to evaluate a hostess on. They knew right. what to evaluate a waiter or a waitress on. They understood the restaurant industry and how it worked. Right. So okay, so you were a hostess, and you did that for the and summer, that, and I was right? also busing. Okay. Oh, there too. Yeah. Okay. With our second cousin and our cousin and our other cousin mm-hmm. and like the 12 other cousins who worked <laughs> in this restaurant. <laughs> and um, I loved busing and I still love busing because you don't have to talk to anyone. Uh-huh. And you can just y- there's always something to do. You can just keep moving. Uh-huh. So I liked I liked busing a lot and you could make good money and not have to engage with any kind of person <laughs> right other than like filling water other than stuff. the yeah. waiters or the waitresses who oh, are like go right. get me five waters for table six and then you know the irate people who'd be like where's our food and i'd be like i'll get your waiter for you <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> yeah i liked i liked busing and that then i went back to so i was there for a couple summers and then i went back to minnesota and got a job busing at this restaurant that was on a lake and uh, a little lake this is the Little Lake restaurant. I worked at a Big Lake restaurant too. Oh, later. Yeah. Okay. So how old were you at this point? Like f- 15. 15. Okay. Yeah. And um, because I didn't even have my license yet. And then uh, I had to get a ride. But I was a busser. And this was before apparently Latinos were in Minnesota. I don't know. Because huh. I was a little white girl and I was doing jobs that you will never see a little white girl doing in a restaurant anymore, oh, ever. Wow, like what? Like I had to take out every garbage in the place. No, you never see that. Every single one. This was a restaurant that had a fine dining room, a bar upstairs. It had a di- like on a lounge in the bar upstairs. So there was the fine dining room. And then there was a bar that separated the fine dining room and the lounge. Uh-huh. And um, the Vikings always used to come in on Sunday after their games. Uh-huh. And downstairs, there was a whole downstairs bar and a whole downstairs restaurant. And I had to take out every garbage in <laughs> the whole place. That's nuts. Yeah. And I got glass in my eye once oh. because I had to take out all the bottles from the freaking bars. Yeah, that's not something that's no. really done anymore. I made a fortune in this place, though, because I was the only busser. And I was the one For taking the out... the whole restaurant? Well, yeah. And I would take out all the garbages <laughs> at the end of the night. And everyone <laughs> felt so bad for me. And, of course, you're, like, probably running around living the life. I loved it. I made so much money because I was the only busser and I worked so hard. And um, the guy who was my manager, his... His uncle owned the place, and I had the biggest crush on him in the entire world. And the guy who, or the uncle, the guy, the guy. Okay. my manager, and he was probably twice my age. Uh, yeah, he was twice my age at that point. 
Um, so you were 15 and he was 30? Yeah. Okay. Like, okay. and then, I mean, I turned 16 shortly thereafter. I was there for a while and I did everything in this restaurant except for waitress because I never was old enough to waitress when I was there because I think you had to be 18 to serve liquor. Yeah. And so I hostess and bust and then I became a hostess and then I was always hostessing and stuff too, which was a big job there too. But I worked there. I loved it. I loved having money. Uh-huh. And then I worked in, and so yeah, so that was 16 to 17. And I remember you saying, well, I don't know if you've said it on the podcast or not before, but you like just glamorized the life of those servers in your uh, mind. And so when I was 16 and my mom said, don't glamorize them, they're losers. <laughs> right, but you were just so enthralled by the whole and life. And they used to the go lifestyle. to this little dive bar, the Red Rooster afterwards, and I was so jealous I couldn't go. They and could sit and drink and smoke cigarettes. Yeah, and, like, and this was when you could smoke inside restaurants still. Yeah, and the, it, they just seemed so cool to you. They did. They were just, and you know, it's funny with perspective. You're like, no, they were just townies, uh -huh. you know, just like local townies. Uh-huh. And I just thought they were the cat's pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, um, okay, so then. So then I, again, spent another summer in the same place, I believe. In, 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 in our hometown. In our my hometown. hometown. Yep. I think. Yeah, I think you went back there for yeah. a years. It's a kind of a blur that that was the year that I think I was living in like i think yeah. that was a year the south park no was that the summer it's such a blur all these years are such a blur well then because then when you were what 17 18 One, your senior year you spent you stayed in rhode island right and you were we that's when you and i started hanging out a lot i was a sophomore in high school and you were so a right so in between so right Maybe it wasn't until the end of my freshman year then that I started working. Yeah, eighth grade's a little young. I feel like I was though. But I can see it. So you spent multiple years there. Okay, so then you were working. But I don't know if we went back that summer because that was the first summer that they were divorced. I think we only went back for two weeks. Mm. I don't think we went back for the whole summer. I don't think you had a place for us. So I right. do think it actually was my after my freshman year and then after my sophomore year I went back and then after my junior year I that was a crazy summer. That yeah. was like the summer of insanity. Was that when you had a, an apartment with our other cousin or or was that later? No. That was after my senior year. Okay. And then the following summer I never came back east cuz I was in rehab. That's right. But yeah, that summer, that was after my senior year. I had an apartment with our cousin. Right. <laughs> it was, that was also a crazy right. summer too. Anyway, getting back to, so you were doing the hostess buster thing in the summers, uh, but then you moved to the, the the Big Lake restaurant, right? In when you were what, 19, 18, 19? Oh, that was the summer of my senior year. I didn't come back east. Okay. I came back east for two, that was before... Yeah, that's where I was working. I was working at Lord Fletcher's. It's this huge restaurant on Lake Minnetonka where all the boats dock, and it's like an it's even an even bigger version of the place that I was working. Before. So was that the first time you ever actually waitressed? Were you old enough at that point? Yeah, that's when I was waitressing. I wasn't old enough to waitress, but they let me waitress because I had been working in restaurants for so long. At that point, they were like, "Put her on the floor." Uh -huh. I was seventeen. Uh huh. And I was about to be 18 that fall. So right. that was, yeah, that was in between my, I think I worked there for a year. You, If you were 17, it would have been after your junior year. This is all a blur. But I was drugged and raped. That's, that's all, this is all revolving right. around that. The summer before I w went to rehab, which was the year, I, it was right before I went to college. Right. And, but so you... You must have started working there after you left Rhode Island. You must have gone back, right? Because you oh, were yeah, in Rhode, in Rhode Island, Island for the that like fall and early winter. It's a really big blur. So I was at that restaurant beforehand. Yeah, that's what the I thought. The summer before. That's what because I thought. Because I... Either way, timeline it doesn't particularly matter too much. I was at uh I was at the Little Lake one, I think. Because then I had to like run away 
<laughs> That's part of the, then I had to run away and like not go back home because <laughs> why did you have to run away? <laughs> You can't just drop that and be like, but moving on, this is story hour. You have to tell the story. Well, because I lost my virginity to my manager <laughs> and I was underage and he was not. He uh, was he like was 40. Like, he was 32. <laughs> and I was worried. That Wait, was he this would the same guy jail. you had the crush on? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I spent three, two or three years trying to seduce Chasing him. him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It finally wore him down. But it was still little Lolita before you turned eighteen. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, I think it was like, <laughs> yeah, I was seventeen when I lost my virginity. Uh huh. Which is pretty old, actually, for me. Uh huh. I think it's because I knew once those floodgates were open, <laughs> there would be um, problems. What? So then you had to run away, quote unquote. Why? Well, I had to leave Minnesota. <laughs> why? <laughs> Were you like publicly shamed in the streets? What happened? I was just worried that he would end up going to jail if I went back. Oh, it's okay. part of the reason that I stayed in Rhode Island. I've never told anyone that. Uh huh. <laughs> okay, so that was your junior year. You would have that yeah. would have happened. Okay. So it was uh, sometime in my junior. Oh yeah, it was totally my junior year because I nearly f I was doing great in my grades and then. Also, things were going a little bananas at my house that year. Like in my in my household, it was insane. Uh -huh. One of the more insane years of all of the years, which is saying a lot. And it just came off. I I just stopped caring. Right. That was the year I stopped caring. And then I that was also the year that I just wrote about on Patreon that I missed a third of my. <laughs> Which is a great story. My junior year of high school. Because I think this is the most brilliant thing you ever could have done in your life. So I move. Uh, so just to take you through the timeline of my high school, we'll just go through that. My fr I had moved a lot. I went to three eighth grades and then two freshmen, and then I started my. And then we moved to the suburbs from the city where uh -huh. I was my freshman year, and started at a new school from scratch my sophomore year. But at that point I had been to so many schools, I kind of knew the drill. So whenever my mom would write me a note, I would rewrite the note in and, your own in handwriting. My own, well, like trying to make it look like my mom's handwriting, but it's enough that it was my own handwriting. Right. Which is so brilliant upon brilliant to do think, right off know, the bat. At I a think new they school. changed another rule based on me too, is that it had to come in a sealed envelope. <laughs> Because after after my shenanigans, so because normally you just like fold a piece of paper and give it to the kid, and right. it's like here Bridget was absent because she had her teeth cleaned or whatever. So I rewrote them, and then they would call because I was new, and they would make sure that the note came from my mom. My mom, having written the note that day, was like, "Yeah, that's my handwriting." And then after a while, they stopped calling, and this was at every school they uh -huh. would do this. They'd call like the first three notes, and then they would not call anymore because they'd recognize or could compare the handwriting. And so then so she was smart enough not to skip until this had all been established. Well, yeah, no, I had to first lay the groundwork. But and you were also like a per perfect straight A student at this point, too. So the the craziness is that you were planning this while you were still like <laughs> on the straight and narrow. <laughs> you just wanted to have the option. I yeah, guess. I did. I just wanted the option. <laughs> and this was when I had just got my license um, my sophomore year. And I was I loved skipping school and driving downtown to Minneapolis and going to like uptown and hanging out in coffee shops. And then and I you could skip occasionally without it affecting you. At and all. then at some point I lost my virginity and then I started skipping school to go have sex. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, there's a reason you waited so long. You knew this would happen. <laughs> I just remember we would like have these afternoons or we wouldn't do any. I would just skip like one or two periods for lunch and then go back. And and that was fun. And also a blur. I don't really remember all that much. I was I was smoking so much weed back then, too. My grades started suffering, obviously. I missed a lot of school. Little did I know, I wasn't keeping track of how much school I was missing, which was my first fatal mistake. I should have been. And then it triggered a letter automatically when I missed a certain number of absences that I wasn't allowed to miss any school without a doctor's note. Uh-huh. 
And so one day I was in school and I heard the principal call me down to the, they called me down to the office and I was like, oh shit. I, I kind of knew it that was I was coming. busted. Yeah. yeah. Cause I had really been pushing it. I mean, I was writing it. It got to the point where I wasn't missing a period. I would walk up to school with my friend who skipped with me all the time and I would be like, nah, nah. And it was like for a whole day. It uh-huh. wasn't, I would just, I would walk up and be like, yeah, no, I'm not feeling it. And then write myself a note. <laughs> so I was getting a little uh, loose with the, with the absences. Mm-hmm, way too loose. Then they called my mom in and then I got down to the office and saw her and there was, I'm not kidding, like a stack of notes in front of her. And she was like, not mine, not mine, not mine. None of them were hers. And there were dozens of them. Uh Uh-huh. Multiple dozens. So you were busted. They busted me and they gave me pretension, which we didn't have detention. It was pretension, which was before school, which was the worst. And... Luckily, my drug dealer friend got busted for something around the same time. And so he would he had a lot of pretensions and he would pick me up and we would do mushrooms on the way to pretension. (laughs) And then but you had to go to pretension every single day for for the the rest rest of the school school year, year, which was it was this was like March. Uh Uh-huh. It was nightmare, like three months. (laughs) And I ended up. Having to go to pretension. And you'd be like shrooming. Awesome. That was great though. Or we'd just be so baked. And then he got out after, I think he only had to do like two weeks and I still had to go. And it was so boring and I hated it. And then lo and behold, came along some food drive and they said, adorably because who has pretension for the rest of the year they didn't suspend me which they could have and they probably should have looking back uh-huh. but because my grades were still decent right um and i don't know they 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 just decided not to so then that was they figured pretension was actually a worse i think i actually wanted to be suspended too i was like please god no but uh-huh. they realized pretension was a worse punishment and I ended up they this food drive you could do for like every 10 canned goods that you brought in, you would get one pretension off. And now, mind you, I had tons of money because I was waitressing Uh or busting tables or whatever I was doing at that point. We can't remember. I think I was waitressing at that point. And yeah, you'd lost your virginity. So you were waitressing. No, I don't. I was no, I guess I was hostessing and busing still, but mostly hostessing at this point. That's what manager fucked a busser. I think I was hostessing at this point. Yeah. So I could dress up. Uh, and I took a pay cut seductive. so I could look hot. <laughs> yeah, that's This is all really right. revealing. <laughs> okay, so keep going. I didn't want to do that grunt work anymore. Yeah. Jeez, Louise. After I got the glass in my eye, I was like, okay, I'm done with this. Fair enough. Um, I had like a red cut on my eyeball and I looked all gnarly (laughs) and it it took forever to heal. And then I bought probably maybe only like $40. I don't think it was that much, but I bought my way out of pretension basically. So you bought enough canned goods or food. For every pretension I had For every pretension you had left. And then some. (laughs) And then I went in and I was like, boom, I'm out, bitches. (laughs) Maybe I didn't say bitches, but I did say I'm out. And they were like mad and they couldn't really do anything about it. And they felt, I mean, they did. Yeah, they felt like it wasn't fair, but there was no rules against it. And they failed to note down that you could not use this loophole to escape. How they didn't see that coming I don't know. after I figured out the first loophole know, in the right? system. So then they changed the rule after that, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they stopped. You couldn't buy your way out of pretension. Or you can only anymore. buy your way out of like five. Or three or something. All right. So let's get back to waitressing because we still have a lot of ground to cover. So you worked at that restaurant and you were waitress. So do you remember kind of your first waitressing experience? No. Not not the first time, but just kind of like that first summer? No. No, you just, it was a smooth transition from waitress to waitress. I do not remember anything. From that whole time was so, and that was like the insanity was ramping up on all fronts. Right. I mean, I don't remember much. I was drinking a lot Mm -hmm. and partying a lot and I was smoking tons of weed 
And I'd started doing harder drugs here and there. I'd be gone. Well, then you you came and lived in Rhode Island. You were going to do your senior year in Rhode Island because your yeah. brother was living there. Yeah. And you two lived in this little, smart little and house away. together. To live with my dad, on which our is grandparents like living property. by yourself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I lived with my brother and my dad. And I put that in quotes only because my dad, was just, it was just me and my brother. Right. And and that's when you and I, and I, I was going to, I was a day student at a boarding school at this point. <laughs> and then I started that. And our, I know, I'm, that's what I'm getting to. And then oh, our God. aunt and uncle There have been some scandalous relationships in my time. Our aunt and uncle worked at this boarding school <laughs> that I went to, attended, uh, and it was like, they were, he was like the director of athletics or something, and she was his wife. And so they they lived in, in a, an apartment on campus and like moderated this dorm. Like <laughs> you, they'd have to check in like the students This place the was like and, a freaking movie. Like, and it's from so, the 90s. and you and I would hang out and we would hang out at their, you like were living in their apartment too half the time. Mm-hmm. And um, I was really close with my aunt. She was like a mom to me in many ways. And we, w- we would hang out a lot. And that's really when we got close after the years of our childhood being mm-hmm separated through various means <laughs> we'll tell that story too i don't know if we ever told that story but <laughs> separated because by our cousin <laughs> gee i wonder why your parents wouldn't want you to hang out with me yeah I, well yeah recounting these you're like i was basically doing hard drugs at this point <laughs> <laughs> and sleeping with my managers i mean jesus so then i was a wild you child. started dating one of the teachers who worked <laughs> at this school <laughs> Love is love, man. <laughs> so, you know, and these teachers are like, you know, they're fresh out of college. He I think was he was like 23. Baby. Yeah, yeah. He was young. The, and you were 18. Which you had was turned 18 at that point. More age appropriate for me at that point. Too. Right. I just, I'll never, ever forget when I came to visit you. Like, I was at your house and <laughs> we were hanging out at your house and you had been sick and I came to see you. And you walked in the door with like some grocery bags because <laughs> he was bringing you food because you were sick. And, and he was like, bear. oh, he uh, a teddy. hi, Maggie. Like it, I was a student and he would have probably gotten in a lot of trouble for this relationship, even though you were 18. And even though you yeah, I was were as not, old as some of his you students. were not attending the school, it was not an appropriate relationship. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, uh, I just came to see your dad, Bridget. <laughs> Like, and your dad walked in and he knew about it and he was like oh hey like <laughs> they had the most awkward conversation ever and left <laughs> and yeah i was like thanks for the groceries <laughs> and the teddy bear uh, i had that my teddy- parents were concerned that we were spending so much time <laughs> i wonder why at that point i uh had that teddy bear for a long time all right, so then, then you went back to Minnesota though halfway through the year. Yeah, that was a disaster. There, one of the writing prompts that all these writing prompts that I'm behind on, I realized I'm behind on them because they trigger like the worst memories ever of your life. Yeah, yeah. like the one about my childhood shoes. I'm like, oh, oh do we boy. really have to tell that story again? When my dad spanked me for swearing, and it's the reason you didn't talk to him for like two years. <laughs> <laughs> It was more the torture of making me walk up three flights of stairs where I was staring at my little snorkel shoes. <laughs> All right. So then you went back to Minnesota and then you went yeah, to... Yeah, that's one of my biggest regrets. So, oh, one of the writing prompts is about regrets. And this is one of my regrets. Wait, is You left. That I left. I went back to Minnesota. I shouldn't have. I broke up with the love of my life. Shouldn't have done that. Although, whatever. Thank God I'd you probably escaped have that phase. Five fate. children right now. <laughs> if I hadn't. And have a nursery home, like nursery, whatever. Be a nursery, like run daycare. your own homeschool and nursery. <laughs> I'd have my own daycare. And I'd be just, yeah. You'd have killed yourself at this point. I don't know. Who knows? But that would have been my fate. And. I also didn't go to UNH and I should have. I should have gone to a school that was in the East Coast and I went to freaking stupid St. Thomas University in Minnesota and I should have got the F out of Minnesota because I always hated it there 
And that was my true downfall. Right. Everything really downward spiraled. And we cover a lot of this in one of the other story hours, uh, the addiction one. But that that was when you were drugged and raped at working at that restaurant, right? By one of the customers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. In 1998, the mm-hmm. summer of 98. No, summer of 97. Yeah, I was in rehab the summer of 98. Okay. So then I went to rehab and got out of rehab. And then I went to, oh, I worked my first job out of rehab was a coffee shop. And I had to freaking bike 5 a.m. Oh, my God. In the freezing cold on this shitty ass bike. And in, in downtown Minneapolis, right? Yeah, it was a caribou coffee, which is a Minnesota Midwestern thing. And then I graduated out of there and got a job at this restaurant called Thelio's. They had this cavatappi pasta. I still remember it. God, it was good. And then I was there for a while. I don't, I think I was waitressing there too. Did it's such a blur. significant happen there? I met one of my best friends, Kyle. Mm. That's where we met. Nice. And fell in love with them. And there was a love triangle. Ah. Uh-huh. And, but he and I are still close. He's in New York now. And uh, he was dating this girl and they were in love. And then we all ended up in LA. It was nuts. Like uh, everybody from that time kind of all graduated back to LA. So then I was there. Oh, no. I did get fired. I did have a job. I had a waitressing job when I was in college and I got my own place second semester. I wasn't in the dorms anymore because I hated them. Right. And then I lived with my friend and that didn't work out. And then I got my own place. Also, not a great choice for me. Uh, right. Because I had too much freedom. But this is when you were doing heroin at this point yeah. too, right? Yeah. 100%. But I, it's the only job I've ever been fired from to this day that I know of. Why were you fired? Um, Because I was always on heroin at work. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that'll do it. <laughs> and I was like dope sick in the bathroom and missing shifts. And and then Mame died, our grandma. Uh-huh. And then I had to miss some shifts in the middle of all this uh-huh. nonsense. Yeah, this time of year for me, shit. It's it's just brutal. Ugh. From Mame's death I to I always joke that Mother's if Day. I cannot manage to kill myself accidentally or intentionally in May. From March through May, yeah. Yeah, I'll maybe make it another year. <laughs> Although now I think feel like I need to add January through February to that too. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> We're adding months, suicidal watch months. Okay, so you got, so then you were working at Filios. And how long were you in Minnesota after after you got out of rehab? Um, <sighs> That was the darkest time. Oh, God. Yeah. Let's see. I was living, I got out, okay, hold on, let me think. I got out of rehab in, I feel like the fall of my, I was there for a long time. Right, you were there for like- May, like like seven months. Mm -hmm. So I think I got out right before my, what it had been, my 20th 20th birthday. It's so crazy to me how- young I was and how old I felt. Well, you'd lived a lot of life. I had given up on my life already though. Yeah. And this is another thing looking back that I want to kill every girl that I meet when she comes into the program and like my mo- one of my recent, like any any young girl that I work with, even, what, whether they're in a program or not or anything, anyone I'm mentoring, you know, at 23, I know that feeling. She, this girl came in and she's like, uh, it's too late for I've me. I'm 23. And I'm yeah. like, I know this feeling and it is not true. And it will cost you more years of your life. And it definitely cost me. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. With stress and anxiety, many people can often feel exhausted during the day, but then it's time to go to bed and they just can't fall asleep. If worry is affecting your days and nights, it's probably also affecting your overall health. That's why we're partnering with Calm, the number one app to help you reduce your anxiety and stress and help you sleep better. More than 40 million people around the world have downloaded it. If you head to calm.com slash walk in, you'll get 25% off a Calm premium subscription, which includes guided meditations on issues like anxiety, stress, and focus, including a brand new meditation each day, daily calm, my favorite, 
There are also sleep stories, which are bedtime stories for adults designed to help you relax. And they even have soothing music and more. My favorites are the body scans. It's a way to just relax your whole body and it takes you through. It's a a guided meditation that takes you through your whole body. I also love just sometimes their nature sounds are really helpful to me. The sound of rain, the sound of just the woods, especially being in a city. It just puts me in that frame of mind of being somewhere peaceful and calm. And I know that feeling of having that restless mind and not being able to sleep at night and the breathing exercises, just being able to focus on your breath, they instantly calm me down as well and put me in that space that calms my nervous system so that I can get a good night's rest and just be a little bit less stressed about life. I really, really can't say enough about this meditation app. It has changed my life and the sleep stuff. So right now, Walk-In's Welcome listeners get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash walk-in. That's C-A-L-M dot C-O-M slash walk-in, W-A-L-K-I-N. Get unlimited access to all of Calm's content today at calm.com slash walk in. But I did try to start rebuilding and I felt like I was on a really good path. And then I was so I I got out and then I was living in this house in uptown um, Minneapolis. And it's a part of like the urban part. There's downtown and uptown with a bunch of junkies and then everybody relapsed. And then I don't it's like all such a blur. I don't know if it was the summer. I don't know. At some point, I just up and left and moved to uh, L.A. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, it was, I guess it was, when did I go see my mom in the psych ward? It was Mother's Day. That's A right. year later. A year after you had checked into mo- into rehab on Mother's yes. Day. Yes. 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 So that was right after my stepdad slit his wrist. And so that's why she was in the psych ward. Right. And that was after all the things. Right. And then I left. So yeah, I must have moved to L.A. like that that summer and then you were there for six months or did i move to la or did i go back east i can't remember i think you moved to la didn't wasn't that when you were living in on uh, in the cute little apartment building complex we live in now no i moved to the valley first that's when i was with me oh, right, right 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 and then you came Me-amber. back to then you came back to minnesota briefly and then you went back to la and that's when you were living there for a while i think uh, sorry I you can't weren't remember. in our hometown until later and then yeah because i moved well yeah yeah then so then were you were you waitressing when you moved when you were living in our apartment building no in in the valley you worked at the bike shop right yeah and i worked um as an extra right but were you waitressing when you lived in uh santa monica no that's when i started working with autistic kids that's right which and I was will be another story hour. Yeah. Uh, and then I was also doing Buddy Head. I was right. That's the, the beginning of like girl. my writing career. Yes. Kind of. And so that yeah, there there were some years where I wasn't waitressing. And then and then I went back to our hometown. Uh-huh. And well, I it was after the whole have I told the Dagmar story? Yes. Okay, I thought I did. Yes. So the, this crazy lady wanted to kill me. My little sister um, had my nephew. I wanted to go spend a summer with them. And right, your little sister, she had a baby, and she was living in my or back in Rhode Island. Yeah. At that point, with your dad. Yeah, she was living, and so I wanted to go pay off my debt, get away from the lady who wanted to kill me. And um, spend some time with my sister and my nephew. And you can hear the Dagmar story in the Fetacy Origin Story podcast. Yes. Then I ended, and my dad said, don't get stuck in the rut here, Bridget. It's a trap. And I was like, okay, dude. And I had that summer and I got a job in PR where I was writing. That's right. The For that crazy lady. And, and your best friend was working there too she came oh yeah and, and she lived. was working at the a restaurant down but that was that was a little later she came and lived there she came and worked with you at that place that yeah. briefly then you guys both quit 
<laughs> and she was working. Uh, she and I worked at the same restaurant that summer. And she, you, all three of you were living in the barn. Yeah. Right. But first, you and your sister were living at the sh- that shoebox. Yeah. And you like basically booted your dad out. Yeah. <laughs> Where was I working? Where was it? Oh, it was at my dad's girlfriend's restaurant. Oh, she that's opened one. Right. That was that. That year, that whole you and year. your sister were both working there. Yeah, and it was like a show. <laughs> oh God, you would get dressed up in your little outfits every night. It was all locals. It was yeah. all kind of like rich locals who come in, and you guys would get tipped like fifty percent. Yeah, on was bills nuts. and stuff because they knew you and they knew your dad and they knew the owner of the restaurant and they knew blah blah blah. Yeah, and, that was a good gig. And so then I worked my day job during the week and I worked there on the weekends. That's right. And then I got somehow decided to stay. And then I was working um, still there. And then I started working up at this other restaurant, La Forge. Right. Because I wanted to get m- more money and a new job. It's sometimes waitressing. You're just like, I need a change of venue. I don't remember why I changed at all. Again, very much a blur. I feel like you started working there in the winter because it was more of a winter place. And like it had oh, more of a yeah. crowd in the winter. God, I was singing that song, um, Silver Springs, uh-huh. on repeat the other day. Not for any specific reason. <laughs> And <laughs> and um, you flashed back to LaForge. Yes, because I used to. So one of the things I one of my secrets is that I sing and it's my actual true passion more than anything. I had a whole dream the other night where I quit everything and became a singer. Huh. And that was like the happiest dream of my life. But they would have a piano. LaForge was kind of for an older crowd. Yeah. And they would have a piano was- player in on Friday nights. Friday nights? Friday and Saturdays. Uh-huh. And he was great. And one night after we closed, he was still playing and we were all jumping up and singing. And then I got up and started singing and they were like, whoa, what the heck? You should jump up and sing sometimes. And then sometimes became like... <laughs> you would sing on Friday nights. <laughs> yeah, but I was still waiting tables. I know. <laughs> so so I they'd like, like have you jump up in between running. And uh, my tables would be like, where's our waitress? Like, oh, she's, oh, she's just singing. singing up there in her waitressing outfit. There are pictures of me and like waitressing clothes singing and then it started getting packed and people were coming in Uh and and I wasn't making any money off it so I started feeling you know and they were kind of demanding that I get up there I'm like okay this is this is not fair and I would come there and eat the French onion soup and we would that's when we were drinking a lot of mudslides on the rocks that's when I got a (laughs) kidney infection because I was drinking a lot of mudslides on the rocks and you and your future husband were dating at that point right (laughs) yeah I think we were and everyone used to say, can I get a white Russian? <laughs> and he would raise his hand and be like, I'm a white Russian. I'm right here. Okay. So you worked there. Were you still working at your dad's girlfriend's place too? I don't think so. Once I think you got, it was done. Okay. Because then you guys got then married. Then we, well, then we got married. Then you I eloped. started working at the Parrot. Oh. <laughs> That was the darkest winter of my life. Because you weren't making enough money at at LaForge. So explain this restaurant to people so that they understand the hell that it was. (laughs) It's three stories. It's a three-story restaurant. And And I wonder why I have like varicose veins. And you you would think that there would be a kitchen on every floor. There wasn't. There was only a kitchen on the ground floor, right? No, there was one on the ground floor and on the second floor. Okay. But you still had to bring all your food up to the third floor if you were on the third floor. And there we're talking huge trays of, and this was like a big tourist restaurant where it was like tourist food, high turnover, big tables. High turnover, horribly, horrible quality food. Right. But big people would come in in parties of like 10. And And it would be like these really bold looking tropical like plates and there was a million different tropical drinks and the menu was huge. And the menu was huge. But you had to carry these fully loaded trays, <laughs> usually with states pl- plates stacked on top of each other. They, you'd put like food covers My on the plates. My been through a lot. And yeah. you, so you'd be carrying eight to 10 really heavy plates on a tray up, up and down stairs. You just do it. 
Yeah, but more than anything, I hated the way they exploited us for two eighty nine an hour and made us come in early before our shifts on weekends and freaking clean. Which is illegal. Totally illegal. And I used to call them out on that and he used to call me Rosie the Riveteer because I would be like, this is not legal and get all the waitresses r- riled up. Uh-huh. And I'm like, this is not okay. You no. need to like hire a cleaning no, crew. No, you, you can't, can't do force that. Force us to do it's not side work. It's outside of our duties as a waitress. Because technically, I went and looked at all of the rules, and it has to be something that's within the boundaries of your duties as a waitress. Which means, for instance, marrying ketchups or, or polishing silverware. silverware. Yeah, not putting a freaking backpack on. And vacuuming and polishing brass and cleaning. Such bullshit. Like that is so illegal. And I don't know if a lot of people understand this is waiters, waiters and waitresses make less than minimum wage. They make like waiter even, server yeah, minimum not wage. Yeah, here. It's great. At least, they, <laughs> yeah, in Rhode Island they did. So minimum wage, I think at that point was like, Ten, twelve dollars an hour. We'd be getting two eighty nine an hour, and that's why tipping is is so important. Like that's where you make all your money is tips. I don't even know how they get away with that in Rhode Island. I don't know it's either. Insane. It was like nuts. So we're not we're making literally three dollars an hour. Yeah. So he's saving on getting an actual cleaning crew because he's paying his entire crew three dollars an hour oh, to do, do what you would pay somebody fifteen dollars an hour. Oh, that guy was so shady. Uh huh. So you so I was that. there and I wanted to kill myself and I would think about it every time I got to the third floor and would be polishing and setting up and just even setting up like the monotony of waitressing is so mind numbing in a resort town in the winter, especially where you're it's it's fine in the summer and the fall and the shoulder seasons in particular in a resort town and it's slammed and you're busy and then you have all winter to basically think about all the bad choices choices. you made in your life yeah or all the things you could be doing or would be doing and and should be doing and how you should have saved more money but by the time summer came you were so excited to have money again that you just were like we're going out and getting beers and lobsters whatever Uh you just it, it it's a bad it's rut. It's a rut. It's a definite rut. So And you, I was doing tons yeah, draw I mean all of it. You were married, living in that basement apartment, <laughs> your first basement apartment, eating we, a lot of pizza. I got <laughs> so it was like chubby. next door. Yeah. That's the chubbiest I've ever How been. How long did you work at the parrot? Like for a summer? I worked there for a summer and then into I think like about six a months. A spring. Yeah. And then I started working at the mooring. The well, mooring. We just, the mooring is the original restaurant where you where were I started, where it all began. 14, 15. So I was working at the mooring at that point, and we were working together with our other cousin or two other cousins. And then you were living and with them. And I was living with them. One, one of them and then two of them. And then I moved And I in. was doing. Oh, that's when. Oh, I started working at the mooring when I got separated. Oh, okay. So you were, and you were married for, well, okay, no, because th- you and your husband moved to that other basement apartment. Mm-hmm. And that's when you started writing for a living too. You started writing the column. Yeah, that's when I was at LaForge. That was your first ever paying job. Oh, wait, or was I at the mooring? Where the heck was I? I don't know. I feel like you were at- The mooring? The mooring at that point. Maybe I was still married. You were still married- because you were, I think you just stayed working there while you were separated and you moved in with me. Mm-hmm. I feel like I was at the mooring when I, when I saw the job thing. So I maybe I were. was working you there were, while I was Yeah, married. you were working there. Because remember, you'd get flack for it. So Bridget started writing this column. Because you, we'd go into work together and your customers who were locals would want to talk to you about it. And people oh, would be talking to you about I it. I remember this. I do remember everyone giving me crap. My, they'd say, your poor husband. Because I wrote one about how Valentine's Day was like a nightmare or something. And you know what's funny is the first letter to the editor that I ever got was from a visiting member of AA. <laughs> and someone was like, I'm concerned about the amount of time you mentioned drinking. They're like, why articles? not? No, they said I was doing a dry drunk in public. And I was like, there's nothing dry about this drunk <laughs> that I'm doing in public for the record. Because I wrote some piece about how there was nothing to do in the winter in our hometown. Right. And so you made up a list of things you could do. (laughs) One of them being squirrel chasing. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I was feisty back then. Let's just. Oh, back then. <laughs> like it's all gone away in the meantime. <laughs> yes. Said the girl who wrote a satirical piece about Instagram influencers today. <sighs> okay. So, yeah. So we were all working together. I was living that was with a fun two summer. of my cousins. That was the best summer ever. Uh, and, and then two of my cousins, like one of them got pregnant. Oh, I was still with my husband. And one of them moved to San Francisco. Because I used to punch the dashboard because I had a crush on that guy we were working with. And I was having such a hard time. And That's he right. and I were having oh, a hard God, time. Oh, God, he was hot. Yeah. But then, because by the time you moved in, my our two cousins had moved out. And I was living with two other girls who I would waitressed with. Or it's one of them. Such, I would have to like write down. I have to look at a timeline because this again, it starts to get really no, blurry. We, this was definitely we were working. We were living and working at the morning. I was there for this. So I remember I was going to school. I was finishing night school. College, and I was married. And you were married. Oh, OK. Then you and your husband separated. You came and lived with me for a, a, like the rest of the summer. And then you went on the Phetasy tour, the Phetasy road tour. Oh, yeah which you can hear about in the fetasy origin story story hour. God, so many hours of waitressing. So then, then what happened? Then you got back then from tour. Then I was tour. all over the freaking place. Then you got back from tour. And then I moved in with you. The next job I had after that was in Park City. Yeah. You moved you lived with me, then I moved to, I finished school, moved to Park City, and you came and stayed with me and was waitressing in Park City. And you worked like two or three different restaurants, right? And you were working at that bar, the sidecar. Mm-hmm. You worked at Harrio's. Uh uh-huh, and VIP. And VIP. And I worked at Sherfoot. And you worked at Sherfoot. <laughs> <laughs> this was quite a time. Uh, let me tell you, that winter in Park City, there are some pictures and some stories that are pretty amazing that summer when we were all working at the mooring was so fun it really was that's when we went and saw harry connick jr that was when we i rented the the beach house the beach house we had that party yeah Uh uh-huh because i was homeless Uh uh-huh i was homeless for most of that summer i think well after you lived with me you stayed with me for a while but then you just started beach cottage hopping (laughs) (laughs) I knew it was the end of the the era. Well, still, I ended up having to go bankrupt. And those were all parts of the reasons. Yeah. I was living on, I was just an idiot. Yeah. yeah. So we're back in Park City. And then I was, yeah, I I worked all the time. I was working nonstop and partying. And during Sundance, you met, like, you somehow managed to be working at the two, like, kind of more popular bars. And you were working VIP at Harrios, which is a huge like everyone wants I met to get everybody. in. You met a ton of people. And Dave Matthews grabbed my butt. Nice. It was the greatest moment of my life. <laughs> and then, then you moved to LA, and I stayed in Park City for a long, a little longer. But- yep. And then I worked at El Guapo, <laughs> this sports bar in. It's now the Hollywood? parlor. Yeah, it's not. It's not. It uh, doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, yeah. Gee, I wonder why. There was like more blow moving through that place than there was food and food. drinks. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was like in the middle of Melrose, the shittiest Hollywood crowd. It was, uh, it was so, and I was like the old, I was basically like one of the senior bartenders and I had been there like 60 days. <laughs> like the turnover <laughs> was so high. We would have waitresses for like two weeks and mm-hmm. turn it over. And I was bartending. At least you were bartending. But I hated it. I actually preferred waitressing there because really? I hated being trapped behind the bar. Oh, but right. we would do all the UFC fights and Ugh. it was like the gnarliest crowd and I hated them all. This is why I hate UFC. It has nothing to do with the sport. It has to do with the freaking crowds that I waited on in that stupid bar and how cheap and gross they were. But I still would make a lot of money because it was so busy, but it was just so loud. Sports bars are so loud i would come home and my ears would just be ringing from all the televisions on uh-huh. i mean this is the kind of place it was i got the job they called me in to train me two waitresses didn't show up and so i was just on the floor my first day uh-huh. of training <laughs> you're like i don't need to be trained i'm fine yeah it was fine and then i was there for a while and then i quit and then i just burned out and i was um again got into a lot of old habits like drugs and 
too much drinking and one morning I woke up and I didn't remember how I got home and I quit and then I vowed never to wait tables again. Well, you were just like, I'm never going back there and you didn't. But I also vowed to like get out of the industry. Mm -hmm. I was like, I have to get out of this rut. I'd been in the rut for like a long time at that point. It had been since I was 21 and I was like 28. Mm -hmm. So for seven years, I had pretty much just been... I think you were older than that. I was, was I was I? 28 when I moved out. Maybe 29. Tw- so you were 20, 29, 30. I don't think so. Maybe though. I was 27 when I moved to Utah and I was there for a year. God, maybe. Yeah, it, it was the, I call them the dark years for mm-hmm. a reason. Mm-hmm. I don't remember them. Mm-hmm. Dark as in blacked out. But the, yeah, I mean, I was married five years. So there's five mm-hmm. years of that. Waitressing will... There are times when I was doing it where it would just be like, I need to take a break and like take find something else because it will make you hate people. Oh, I, I like want to start. You just fucking start loathing people in general and every word that comes out of their mouths. Yeah. Because you can't stand how <laughs> awful they are. <laughs> I just want to do a stand up routine that's like 99% of waitressing is basically just trying not to be racist or to like stereotype <laughs> people. <laughs> just stereotyping anyone in general. You're just like, all right, don't, don't uh, give them don't the benefit of the doubt. And then you're like, damn it. And you're like, oh, way to uphold the stereotypes, people. <laughs> Like, please don't be high maintenance table of white ladies. Please don't be uh. with, with a small dog in a purse. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Every uh, time. Then what'd you do after that? After El Guapo. So then I was like hustling freelance. Right, that's right. You were I a yoga was, instructor. You were uh, all those things. Yeah. Working with autistic kids again. I started teaching theater to kids. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, I did anything. I cleaned up my act. There were some, so I mean, cleaned up my act and that no hard drugs <laughs> mm-hmm. and started working with kids. And then I got, jo- then that led to like, that led down its whole path where I right. was w- doing private yoga and working for like some of these huge studio heads and going right. to like all these big wigs houses and and then I started working with kids with special needs but some of them just were like high maintenance kids that needed some support and mm-hmm. then that led me to the school and then and then that I started do- coming in conflict with fetacy because yeah and I was going to comic-con and then you know people would hire me to like be a booth girl or whatever right. and fetacy was live at this point and you were writing on it all the time and like posting pictures and and that's around when I started doing comedy I mean right it was around this and time you shot that video that music video <laughs> that you were in that you encouraged oh, that, that guy to so go be, to become a comedian and he did oh, and yeah. then later he encouraged you Tony to. Baker yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's so the best that was at, right after the master cleanse that we did. Yeah. Maggie and I were so poor. Yeah, so that was like a. I managed to stay out. It was not steady. It was that those years were, you know, that was harder for a different reason because I never. 2008 hit. I lost mm. all my yoga clients. It was like just such a. Ah, uh, just a grind. A we talk about that in the <laughs> fantasy origin story too. That was just. Uh, yeah, so then. I went back to waitressing. Finally, I surrendered after you tr- your travel. Yes, right. I came back from traveling around the world for two years and didn't know what I was going to do. Didn't know what to do. Needed a job. I had and you were with a guy. Who, I had been this rich guy, s- super defiant, and left him. And he was like, "Oh, what are you going to go back and waitress?" I was like, "Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to go like, do. Watch me." Like, okay, tough girl, go back and wait tables after you've been on this yacht with me and see if I care. Um, I'll show you. <laughs> and I'll I sure did show him. <laughs> <laughs> I sure did. Back to slinging pancakes. And I did. And I came back and I got a job at this great place for a great small, like they have a couple of restaurants, but they're restaurateurs and they're guys who started I mean, truly the American dream. They started from one was from Mexico. Another was from Argentina. They started as juicers and and dishwashers. Yeah. And then now they're, you know, multi like have multi million dollar restaurants. And, and their food is so, so good. good. They're quality control. Insane freaks. They are the best people. They understand. They treat their staff amazing. They 
I was one of the only ones that didn't speak Spanish fluently. Mm-hmm. And well, well, we can give them a shout out. What's the name of the restaurant? Cafe Vida. Uh-huh. Go there anywhere you can. If it, they're in L.A. So you were working at one in one location, though, and they were opening another. So you kind of helped them set up the systems in this. Well, no. Then I went back east and helped our cousin oh, because right, she right. opened. This was right before I got sober. So. I was I was just picking up shifts wherever I could. I got a job and they're like, we have one shift for you, but we can. And I was still hustling a million other things. And then I ended up going to the East Coast while I was waiting. They were waiting to get the permits. Right. It just so happened that she needed help because she lost all of her weight staff because during the shoulder season, all of the college kids go back to college and the, she being and my cousin in October are still busy on the East Coast because it's boat show, et cetera. And so I went back and helped and fell into all my old habits that I fall into in my hometown. And it was a horrible disaster. And I pissed everybody off. She and, talks about this in the addiction story hour. Yep. And then I came back here just in time for the other one to open the other cafe Vita in Culver City. Mm-hmm. And I helped them open it. I got sober. I became like, as they say, a worker among workers. But it was the best job to have in early sobriety because it was not really alcohol driven. It was Uh like a breakfast place and brunch and whatnot. And this is why I hate brunch. And I ended up being there for years and helping them open that place and helping them. I ended up managing it because Uh they didn't have a manager. And for a while there were in between managers and I ended up uh, organizing the whole system and, or, and then the company that created the system wanted me to go work for them because they said I had a knack for organizing the programming, the, the service because I'm a waitress, yeah. so I know how to do you that. You know how stuff. it all works. What's the most? And the one that they sense. had at the old Cafe Vita, because it's a restaurant that's ten years old and has been through multi multiple managers, it was like non. It made it had so many people who had gone through. It was just so it disorganized. No yeah. But the staff was so old that if you changed that, it would have messed them up. Uh-huh. So you just had to leave it. But for anyone new, it was like nonsensical. Uh huh. Which is the joys of mom and pop owned businesses, right? Right. Family operated and Mm -hmm. owned. Yeah, I was there for a while and I loved it. And then they got this manager and I had been writing and I was just kind of done. And I was at the point where my writing was making enough, Mm -hmm. barely. But you were selling. You were actually being paid. No, I had a I had a steady writing job, which is like gold in the industry right that was when i had my steady monthly column and i had that for a year and that was enough really to i mean it was barely enough i was i was at my means Mm -hmm. and then i should have probably stayed waitressing but they got this new manager and he and i just didn't see eye to eye and then one day he told me i was being a bully or something to him i don't remember we i i basically laughed in his face And I never went, I just kind of never went back. They, he was, and he ended up getting fired because I told him he was a nutcase, but he said something ridiculous. It was some kind of like, are you? Some sort of snowflake. Yeah. Some snowflake language. You've like hurt my feelings. It was something (laughs) so stupid that a manager wouldn't, should never say a male manager to a female. And then I laughed at him and then he got all (laughs) butt hurt and I couldn't stop laughing, and mm-hmm. then I never went back. And, and it was, that was okay. So then that was your last waitressing job, technically. Technically. Kind of. And so then I got a job at this restaurant that was a diner up the street. This was after a year or two of not wait, a year and a half yeah. or something of not waitressing at I all. I came back from a farm. Mm hmm. And I had savings and money, but I panicked yep. because I just didn't have any writing work. And then, but I had some and just wasn't sure. It was uncertain. Yeah, it wasn't the steady gig anymore. So you but were. But Patreon you, had started going off. Right, right. At that point, it be, was the beginnings. But still, you you were freaked out. So you wanted to fall back on waitress hick. And then I was like, what am I fucking doing? 
you trained like one or two <laughs> once once or twice no like four or five times oh you did yeah but you never worked a shift you never showed up for a shift you were like all right i'm not gonna do this i just felt like it you know it was one of those moments in my life where i asked myself what am i doing because I had made the connections and I had the connections on Twitter. And at this point I had been writing for Playboy for years and I had not only connections, but a byline and I was moving into the kind of center space. So I had started writing for other outlets about other topics like politics and culture. And I just basically realized that for me to try and to take eight hours and to make maybe $150 when I could easily make $150 or even a hundred pitching something, you know, topical two hours to write a column or, and even if it took more, Mm -hmm. even if it took eight hours, it would be better for me to take that eight hours and make that money and, and, and hustle and build myself up there and that was the right decision. That was definitely the right decision. I was mm-hmm. like, I am wasting my time doing this. Well, and you just didn't want to operate out of place of fear. I think you had that moment of panic of being like, I I need to have something Keep steady. Keep money. Yeah. yeah. But, um, and I didn't know that I could trust my writing, but now I, I do. Mm-hmm. And that is Bridget's waitressing journey. So what would you say, what is the most, because uh, you... <laughs> When you were writing the weekly column in our hometown, she caught a lot of flack for this column because it was funny and like weird. And there was people got outraged when she said, like, don't let your kids climb on a dead whale carcass that had washed up on shore. And like, that column it was this, is the best. I mean, uh, it, it's I'll post pretty it amazing. on Patreon. We have all the columns and all the comments that people wrote in. And it's pretty funny. But her final column for this was 15 ways how how to drive your weight person to drink and it was like 15 things basically that drive weight staff crazy and the amount of letters that came in on this column but what is your kind of to summarize advice for people what for would you say like out? how to treat that like how to understand servers for when you go out what is the thing like a lot of people have never waitressed and it's so telling how people treat servers yeah what kind of people they are because they are there to provide a service and they're there to give you your food but they're by the way though i have no patience for waitresses with attitude yeah because i've been in that position too and so i can't stand it when my waitress or waiter it's like okay i understand you're having a hard day i know what it's like to be you and I'll give you the benefit of the doubt, but some some weight, a lot of weight staff just has a bad attitude. And I, I truly, for the most part, loved waiting tables. I, I felt lucky that I could do it. I know I can do it anywhere in the world. I know that I could. And especially once I was sober in particular, I really looked at it as truly being of service. Mm-hmm. And I, I like people and I can remember people's orders easily. And it, it comes, I, you could put me on the floor pretty much anywhere and I could wait tables. And- it is fun. It can be fun. It's a great way to meet people. It's I just a great like that. It, to, I like that you're not sitting at a desk. I cannot. I made the choice pretty young, clearly, when I had that PR job, and it was like the one time I ever had a real quote unquote job, and that it was barely even real. Uh-huh. Um, and I had to work at a desk and in an office, and like we did the governor's ball, and I wrote all these little like blurbs, blurbs for little country club magazines and Nantucket and. Uh, it was all marketing and I I hated it. Mm-hmm. I hated the nine to five grind. I could not stand it. I don't, I, God bless anyone who does that. I, I couldn't do it. And I liked being on my feet. I liked moving around. I liked that I could have control of my own schedule. I liked that I could call, call out. I had right. a lot of freedom. You're essentially you're your own boss when you're a waitress. Right. It's social. You meet a lot of friends. Yeah. Like, like it's regulars. a great way to meet people. When I moved to LA, it was a great way to meet people. Yeah. Your whole group of friends is through that job, essentially. Well, through some people that I met at that job. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it is like we've talked a lot about kind of a lot of shit about waitressing, but it's also 
It's the money's no, I great. I love it. I love it. I would go back to it. Scotty and I talked about it on our podcast. Mm-hmm. How we would I would go back to it in a heartbeat if I could. And it is something that it's like I always feel safe knowing that I have that in my back pocket. Where yeah. it's just like that if something happened, if I lost my job tomorrow, I would be like I would go get a waitressing job while I was looking for another job. Yeah, totally. Because I mean I like, look at even even people around me even my roommate you know she's never waited tables and so there's that like apprehension and i know that i could i it is a security that i can that's a job that you need pretty much anywhere in the world uh-huh. and if you have that it's a skill it is it is, it a, is skill. a skill and it's like there's strategy involved and if you're a good server you can work anywhere i was a great server so was i i, I was a good server i always won the third the um tip average contest of course you did because <laughs> i always got 30 percent uh-huh i love i love it i didn't mind doing it and i think that when it comes to being a customer if you haven't been in the restaurant industry just treat your waitress like a human don't be a dick and try and have your stuff together so that you're not making decisions while she's standing there. If people at your table are making decisions while she's standing there and they're, or they're undecided, not making decisions, but if they're mm-hmm. undecided, Vacillating. set yeah. her free or like, him. Go ahead and go. We'll take another minute. Yeah. Just take a minute. Don't worry about it. And, and also try to understand that there is a lot of stuff out of her control. And right. I like t- cooking times and kitchen and, that generally as a waitress, you are taking crap everywhere you go. Right. You go to the kitchen, you take shit from the cooks, you go take because cooks of from- the special orders that people are. And then you go back to the for. table and then you're getting shit from the table and then you're getting shit from your manager like it. it and you're, you're getting the- shit from the table for the food quality, which you have no control over. It's a, you're a human <laughs> punching bag. And you're in one of those positions where people tend to dump on you because it's like you're they're You're the face of the their experience they you and you they don't think they're gonna see you again if they're not regulars Uh so it's just one of those jobs where i feel like it's people think it's like a safe place to put their you know bad day or whatever and try just not to do that try to put the goodness into your servers Mm -hmm. and the job is hard it's so hard it's and if you tip like tip well but if you have a server who's really just fantastic and above and beyond nothing makes their day more than a couple extra bucks on top of their tip like five dollars to you is nothing but it can just make your whole night as a server getting tipped extra and it's not even about the money it's about the humanity right it's the fact that someone was like nice enough to do that i know that when i over tip my waitress i'm not only just giving her money which she appreciates but i'm making up for her horrible perception of humanity that she might have accumulated that day (laughs) right and i'm doing something to change that and you remember those those people more than you remember the bad ones and letting and letting that person know that they did a great job and that they but but compliments are not tips servers do take pride in in their work good yeah but i hated it when people used to be like i know but that's what i'm saying tip i mean give compliments with tips because if you really do think that they're a great server throw a couple extra bucks on there because it is someone does take pride in their work good servers do take pride and it is a skill and it's hard it's hard to do in a busy restaurant it's hard to do well and give give them two three extra dollars it really does make a difference i think so Mm -hmm. and compliments aren't tips when it's like you're the best waitress we've ever had and they give you 15 percent, you're like yeah go fuck yourself (laughs) (laughs) my dream is to be able to have enough money to go in and give every person on the floor a hundred dollars and there was somebody at Lord Fletcher's that used to do that on the regular. This like guy yeah. who was loaded and he would come in and give every wait staff, every busser, every dishwasher, everyone a hundred dollar bill. Uh-huh. And it just stuck out to me because it was such a nice gesture and so kind. And there were probably like 60 of us working in that place at any given time. Yeah. And I just would love to be able to do that. I'd love to be able to make up for those nights 
I I always tip. I tend to tip twenty to twenty five percent. Always, I always tip twenty. Mm-hmm. But generally, I try to make up for their average where it might be hurting and throw a couple extra bucks just because I know it will. Mm-hmm. I always round up. Yep. So I try to make up for where there might be. You know then. And rule of thumb, if you're getting hooked up at a restaurant, which if you are, it usually means you have experience in the restaurant industry, so you know this rule. Yeah, but no one's getting hooked up who doesn't know this. If you get a, <laughs> if you are getting hooked up, you tip a shit ton, but you tip on the amount that you would have paid. Always. Yeah, I don't not think people what know you that actually, either. Not what, if you get a discount for any reason, tip on the amount that you would have, pay, the full amount you would have paid. <laughs> you want a taco? Hope is, it's, it's time for her walk. She's getting insistent. Those are the waitressing stories. I can't. It's funny the people who are asking me that they were saying, you know, what are some of the funniest ones? What are some of the worst ones? And I can't no, remember the, I don't any have of them. Specifics. Uh, very rarely do I have anything that really stood out as the most memorable. I mean, if you really get a bunch of servers together starting talking about it, you start to remember like, oh, I won. I had this guy. And there there were definitely days I had like two or three experiences where someone actually makes you cry, which is horrible. Usually it's the kitchen that made me cry. Mm, the kitchen can it make you cry. It was very rarely the customers. I only remember one customer ever actually making me cry. That was, yeah. I'm sure it happened to me, but I very rarely but usually it was a kid. Usually it was my dad's girlfriend's son that made me cry because uh-huh. he was a chef. <laughs> oh, that's right. He was such a jerk. But yeah, usually it's the the, the cooks were the ones who made me cry, but and then sometimes they they were trying to make me, you cry. That was like their thing. Yeah, get get a bunch of servers together, and I think that's why honestly I have stories. thick skin. And on Twitter, it's people from working in the wait wait staff industry for ever on the East Coast. I just watched that movie Waiting again oh, recently, it's the, the Ryan Reynolds movie. That is probably one of the best movies ever about the realistic experience it's of the being a server. Only movie in terms of the absolute perfection of what it's like to work and in how the servers and inter- and the staff interacts with each other and all that stuff, but. The car- Ryan Reynolds character is always like, they broke the cardinal rule. Never fuck with people who handle your food. I never saw <laughs> anyone do anything to food, though. I never did either. But still, it's like, I mean, it's it basic mean- common sense in my mind. I never in all of my years of waitressing saw a waitress do any spit in the food or no, I never saw neither. a chef. I mean, that doesn't mean they didn't, but I never. Or that there aren't restaurants where it happens. I never saw it, though. And but that's I never saying saw a lot, it given how many restaurants I've worked in. Uh-huh. Yeah, I, I never saw it, but it's still like it's a good rule of thumb to go by. Just don't fuck with people who serve your food. Yeah, I never saw it, though. Mm-mm. But that movie, if you really want a, a slice of what it's like to be in a in a in a kitchen, there's no better movie than waiting. Yeah, they nailed it. They nailed it. I've never seen anything like it. They really nailed like every type of cast, every too. type of server. There the is angry and server and, that's yeah. been there too long. Uh, yep, it's definitely. It's definitely an interesting industry, and I do wonder if it will be taken over by robots. Probably. Everything will be taken over by robots mm-hmm. or robot overlords. I like to hear anyone's stories from waiting tables. People, Yeah, they were asking me what what the like best thing. I, I can't remember anything specific. It's just all a blur. Yeah. I, I wonder. I mean, I had those black pants, my wa- I, the oh. waitressing pants. Those I got pants them at Express, talk. and I mean... I wonder how many hundreds of thousands of miles I worked in those pants. Seriously. Just waiting tables. I wonder how many, how many coffees I've served. I wonder how many. And waitressing stress dreams. Did you have? Uh, uh, those are the worst. I, I still have them. I, I haven't had one in a long time, but they, they are a thing. You're always in the weeds when you're have a waitressing stress room my worst waitressing stress room ever <laughs> yours is the best was i was working i was the only waitress on in three different restaurants that were all five minutes apart by car so i would like drive to one and show up and it'd be slammed and packed and i'd have to run around getting orders and putting them in and then i'd have to get in my car and go to the next restaurant it was hell it's hell. I just wonder what it does. You know, that that is the stress. And then there's the the like going, you're lying down and you're about to sleep. And then you're like, ah, I forgot to bring se- ketchup to table seven. <laughs> like that thing that someone asked you for. And 
you're like damn it that special request yeah or just something that you just like forgot and i so rarely forgot those things Mm -hmm. that it just would drive me crazy and i'd remember it seven hours later but it is one of those jobs that you don't take it home with you generally which you can once your shift is over you get to just walk away and be like okay see you guys next shift yeah although i think you do take some of the obviously the stress home and the drinking habits and the horrible perception of humanity (laughs) (laughs) but other than that you take nothing home other than that it's it's glorious (laughs) so on that note i want to hear your waitressing or waiting table or bartending stories or service industry or really anything where you're dealing with people because i hear stories from people in retail and they're just as nightmarish Mm -hmm. i hated retail I only did that for one summer and I was like, this is not. I did it for one day. I had to fold (laughs) jeans. I got a job at Lucky Jeans in a mall and I was folding clothes and I was like, yeah, no. (laughs) I feel like (laughs) we've circled back to Bridget's loathing of folding her clothes. It all comes back to that. Uh And this is why I hate clothes and why I'm always naked. (laughs) The end. All right. Until next time, we hope you've enjoyed this story hour. Bye. Just a reminder, check out the Calm app and use your walk-ins welcome listener discount of 25% at calm.com slash walk-in. That's C-A-L-M dot C-O-M slash W-A-L-K-I-N. And it includes unlimited access to all of their content. So get on that. They are the best. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank Ricochet, our composer Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. (laughs) (laughs) It's the dumbest line. (laughs)